This is Taking Stock on Bloomberg. I'm Pim Fox. The European economy has certainly taken the financial world by storm over the past week. And even in the last few hours, we learn of another major European event as David Cameron, Tory leader, takes over as the new prime minister of the United Kingdom. So with Greece, Portugal, Spain and others potentially in need of billions of dollars and euros worth of loans, where should you be investing from a global perspective? Well, we have just the person. We have Charles DeVoe. He joins us. He manages the International Value Advisor. International Fund. Charles, welcome to Bloomberg. Good evening. Talk a little bit about oil. I know we were just talking to uh, Carl Larry about yes. oil and the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. You like the shares of Total. Total, which is a, Total is both a play on oil but increasingly natural gas. And uh, the stock has come down a lot. They have a very strong balance sheet. Even though it's a large company, it's very well managed and uh, it's just cheap. Now, like Carl, we are interested as well, medium term, uh, with natural gas and uh, we're also looking to, to do some, some buying in that space. But again, short and medium term outlook for natural gas is, uh, is quite bleak. Yeah, well, I was going to say, because everybody that I talk to about natural gas says no matter what the companies tell you, it is very difficult to make money pumping natural gas out of the, mar out of the ground right now at $4 per million BTU. Yes, which is why we're focusing on companies that are both low cost and have strong balance sheets so that whether the recovery takes place in a year from now or two years from now, will do well. You say two years from now. Is anybody a long-term investor for two years these days? I'm afraid we are old school. You're old school. Two years at least? Well, at least, well, you know, if uh, the price of the stocks we buy decide to meet their intrinsic value within three months, you know, we'll happily take our profits. But we, the operative assumption is that it may take two, three, four years for the, the price of the stock to reach what we think its real value is. All right. So can I assume that you were doing any buying last week when prices fell? Ab absolutely. Markets are here to serve us, at least last time I checked. And so we were able to do some buying on Thursday afternoon, on, on Friday. Yesterday as well, Monday, but some stocks ran up so much that they, the prices exceeded some of the limits we had put. When you look at what happened in the markets the last week, do you step back and say, boy, this is a much, this is a much changed kind of investing environment? Well, yes and no. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm old enough to have been around during the uh, October 87 crash. You know, we had the uh, program tra trading was one of the, the catalysts that explained a lot of what happened that, that morning, that day. So, no, nothing uh, has changed. Uh, you know, human beings remain emotional, greed, fear. And uh, so nothing new under the well, sun. Well, at least that's something you can count on. Absolutely. And talk a little bit about the uh, investment that you have in Asia right now. This is Genting, Malaysia. Uh, this is really about, uh, well, leisure. It, it's about leisure. It's about the growing um, you know, emergence of you know, middle classes in Asia. The fact that they have uh, more disposable income to to spend. It's a name you know we had been involved with on and off for 20 years, so we we're very familiar with it. It's a local currency business, uh, so it's uh, as time goes on, if the, the Malaysian economy keeps growing, we'll do well on the stock, but also through the currency, the Malaysian ringing appreciating against the dollar. From a valuation standpoint, it's dirt cheap at uh, less than seven times operating income. What about the family participation in Genting, Malaysia? Nothing wrong with that. They've uh, they've done some a few. They've made a few mistakes over the years. They've uh, diversified to some extent, but using the parent company to do so, not Genting Malaysia specifically. All right. Talk about. Let's go to Europe now. Tell me about test and measurement. I want to know about the Bureau Veritas. Bureau Veritas is uh, is a French-based company, yet it's a totally global company. Which is why when I hear people question why we own anything in Europe, in Europe because of Greece, I try to remind them that many companies, Nestle, Sodexo, Brevetas, are in fact totally multinational, have very little to do with Greece and Spain. It's a, it's a service business. They inspect plants, nuclear plants. Uh, one of their strengths is ships. When a new ship is built, they do the inspection. Every five years later, they have to do a follow-up inspection. So it's a wonderful fee-based business. Uh, very recurring and it's a play on as more and more people buy goods from China for instance there's a need to make sure that those plants uh, meet certain specifications. What about valuation when it comes to Bureau Veritas? It's around uh, 10 times operating income so it's not deep value territory but again it's a wonderful business 
and we like the fact that because it's not capital intensive, ultimately inflation will be your friend. Over time, most of the cash flow generated is free cash flow. Very little of it has to be reinvested in the business at potentially higher prices if inflation were to come back. So we think the stock uh, deserves to trade at a much higher multiple than it actually does. Does that mean that shareholders would reap the benefits that maybe they would get either share buyback or some kind of dividend, special dividend? Yes. At the same time, they are absolutely. At the same time, it's still a fragmented industry. And so it makes sense for them to consider uh, additional add-on acquisitions rather than uh, doing buybacks. All right, so you're talking about the test and measurement and this kind of service business with Bureau of Veritas. You talk a little bit about Genting Malaysia and leisure activity in the emerging middle class in Asia, and also Total, the right. oil, the integrated yes. oil giant. But what about gold? What's a value investor doing at gold when gold is $1,233 <laughs> an ounce? Well, that's a brilliant question. Does gold have an interesting value? Maybe, maybe not, but then does the 10-year Treasury note has any value? I think Jim Grant was uh, quipped that uh, it's, a, it's an I owe you nothing. In the case of a 10-year government bond from Europe, it's, it's an I owe you nothing, but I'm not sure who owes you. Uh, again, uh, gold cannot be printed the way, printed the way uh, currencies can be. Uh, the policymakers around the world are scrambling to uh, basically, um, you know, ultimately you know spend their way out of that uh, that bubble and we think ultimately that means uh, the debasement of most currencies the traditional knock against gold is that it bears no interest that knock is a lot less relevant when interest rates are close to zero not to mention real interest rates that are negative in fact it's a real negative real interest rates are almost a, a tailwind in favor of gold gold is something you should have if you have anything to lose and what kind of percentages in terms of the portfolio right now in terms of gold it's 6.7 percent and interestingly enough rightly or wrongly we've chosen to have it all in the form of gold bullion as opposed to gold mining shares we were not too happy to see what happened in australia where they are deciding to, to tax the mining that industry. 40 percent, that potential 40 percent tax. Yes. All right, I want to thank you uh, very much, uh, Charles DeVoe, International Advisors uh, Fund. Thank you very much for your insight. Thank